Welcome or welcome back to Lift You Up Inspiring Health Stories. I'm your host, Tamika Bickham. I am the founder and chief storyteller of TB Media Group. But for the purpose of this podcast, I am your health and happiness matchmaker. Now, before I introduce you to today's guest, you know what I'm going to ask you to do. If you haven't done it already, connect with me on LinkedIn and hit that subscribe button right there on YouTube if you're watching this. I would love to connect with you. Now, today you are going to meet somebody I met probably five or six years ago. His name is Matt Howard. He is the principal percussionist at the LA Philharmonic. And we're talking about all things music, his story, his journey, and obviously the power that music has, especially during this time. Our physical, mental, and emotional health is not just a want, it is a need for happy lives and prosperous businesses. Lift You Up is the podcast where we share inspiring health stories from business owners who are fulfilling their purpose to live their healthiest lives and helping you do the same. From former TV reporter to marketing entrepreneur and content creator, I care about sharing stories that matter and stories that connect us. I'm your host, Tamika Bickham, your health and wellness matchmaker. All right, well, today I am so excited to be joined by Matthew Howard. Um, we we know, <laughs> say hi. Hello. <laughs> and if you are watching, you're seeing that he's joining us from like the coolest space ever, like literally showing off his music chops right now. <laughs> you gotta, you, you have to flaunt this, you know? Uh, where are you right now? Uh, I'm at the Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles, and this is the uh, percussion room in inside the hall. So very rare to have a room like this in an or as an orchestra, you know, to dedicated to percussion like this. Um, so it's great. I love this. I feel honored. Jo you are joining us from the Walt Welcome. Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah. No. Well, thank you. Um, Matt and I know each other from like. Four, five, six years ago now, something like that, um, when he was a New World Symphony Fellow and I was the multimedia storyteller working at the New World Symphony. And um, obviously we just got to know each other because you were a musician there. And I was creating stories and creating content about all of the amazing musicians, Matt included. Um, and one of my favorite stories and one that always stood out to me and I feel like why we you know ended up staying connected was about you winning the principal percussionist job at the la phil your hometown which is where you currently are right now it's, it is where i am right now and um this is you know out of all orchestras i could think of this is probably my dream job and just to win the principal position is even more of an honor and you know i still pinch myself every single day you know because this is absolutely this is a dream so I love that and like honestly now that you say that it's everything's coming back to me because I remember you saying that in that blog article I wrote for New World Symphony's website about you literally winning your dream job like people hope to find their dream job you know after 20 30 years in the workforce but you found it pretty early on yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, the best part actually is um, what got me what got me started down the um, orchestral field was when I uh, went to USC, University of Southern California, and studied with um, Joe Pereira and Jim Baber of the LA Philharmonic, who's the principal tippinist and the section percussionist. And uh, they kind of got me started down all this and super, I mean, I look up to them so much and I still do. And, um, you know, I go through, you know, master's program and uh, end up at New World and then win this position. And to now be colleagues with the people that started me down this path is, and, and to have it be my hometown and a dream job. I mean, it just, it's, it was, yeah, it's just amazing. It's a <laughs> That's amazing. Okay. So. We need to go back through the story and, you know, tell me how you got to where you are now. Like, when did your relationship with music start? Yeah, so um, growing up, I mean, I used to listen to so much music because my parents always had music playing and 
Um, not really orchestral too much, but mainly um, Led Zeppelin and all that stuff. I, I love listening to all that stuff, but also like oldies, like doo-wop and all of the, like a ton of genres, um, except for orchestral. But, um, <laughs> and, but it was fun because I really, you know, really dug that stuff. And um, I always used to attach myself to Led Zeppelin and John Bonham, the drummer. And um, finally, um, my parents gave in and were like, okay, since I'm half Japanese, they were like, we're, we'll let you uh, join this taiko group, which is Japanese drumming. And which was out in this church way in the Culver City, pretty far from where we were living. Um, so every time we went over there, you know, I my first experience hitting things with sticks, and it was amazing, and felt nice to be like very cultural like that. And um, all in the main hall of that church, there was always a drum set, and they would always tell us, "Don't go in there and play that drum set." And guess what I did? <laughs> you went in there and played that drum set. I. Ha- I, I can't help <laughs> okay. So, um, and they kind of figured, you know, okay, you obviously have a bug, you know, for this. You need to go do something. So my uh, my mom brought me to Guitar Center in uh, in Hollywood, and um, ended up finding a like a drum pad and some sticks. And the guy, the teller there, recommended a drum set teacher to me, uh, named Andrew Mills. Um, amazing, amazing guy, and um, got me started down this path of drum set. And um, with his help, I was able to get into my high school, which is an, like an academy of music, but also has you know humanities and whatnot. But it, it was pretty amazing to audition for that program and have you know a ton of confidence in my drum set playing. And I ended up being in the jazz band, and you know just going through high school, they kind of just push you in certain in different areas to try to you know spread you around a bit so um besides the um jazz band they pushed me into like win ensemble and dr- and the marching band and um i had no idea about any of these things uh especially marching band holding the sticks traditional i had zero clue and um especially win ensemble i had zero idea about you know just mallet playing or timpani playing i have i didn't even have sticks for it it was it was i mean you know i had had zero training because you started playing at 15 is that what i read in your bio yeah halfway through my senior year of high school um i took my first lesson with lynn vartan out in the valley um and she taught me my c major scale officially (laughs) on a mallet (laughs) instrument um and um Going through, I ended up in the top jazz band as the the percussionist, not the drum set player, and uh, hurting my finger actually in PE that year, and so I couldn't audition at any college out there. So I was in a weightlifting program that uh, weightlifted with the football players. So we, it was like the upper level, you know, weightlifting class that you know were, were able to work out with them and take you know train with them basically. And um, I don't know, someone rolled some weights off to the side and I was uh, doing like French press with 50 pounds over my head and I let it off to the side and it basically just smashed my finger between the weights. I bet everyone's like, what were you doing weightlifting? You need to be Well, I didn't, I didn't fully fingers. note that I wanted to, you know, do music as a profession at that point. I just thought it was super fun and, you know, I just, I really, I really loved doing it. I really didn't know at that point what I wanted to do for a profession. That's really interesting to know that you didn't know as, you know, a senior in in high school at that point that you wanted to pursue music professionally because I feel like most of the musicians that I've met who are, um, you know, working professionally in music, um, like they started that when they were three for working every day towards that um you know every journey is different but it, it's definitely a different story because that that i don't often hear i mean would you agree absolutely i mean <laughs> i'd say i'm somewhat of an outlier on how late of a start i got but mm-hmm. um every now and then i'll hear a lot of stories about musicians that do that and in a way um it, those people end up being the ones that are the most self-motivated and the most uh, have the most drive because they know that they're competing against people that have years and years of experience. And um, 
but you know those people with years and years of experience at, at some point hitting some type of roadblock and um, you know talent can only get them so far you know I don't fully believe talent is a r fully real thing I mean I do think people work really hard uh, mentally and physically for things um, do you feel like this is like your natural like god-given talent I would say not I would say it's a, a uh, my natural obsession. I would say, I, I, uh, <laughs> I mean, I think with anyone with anything, if they want to get good at it, you have to obsess with it, you know, and not accept just uh, the service level answer. Like you have to know why, you know, um, and like, the science behind everything is just part, it goes, comes with the obsession, you know. So you have this injury. Um, so you don't, you can't play. This is pretty much like half of your senior year, right? Yeah. So what happens from there? Um, well, I quickly am like, well, I just need to get into a college somewhere because I was thinking about auditioning. You know, I have to audition for these schools in order to get in and now I can't play. So um, I ended up going to a community college in the Valley in Los Angeles called Pierce College for a year. Um, and during that time is when I got super obsessed with percussion in particular. And I kind of went hardcore. Something switched, you know, I was like, I, I really love doing this and I think I do have to commit to something. And so, you know, I started getting going really hard. So I started going out of my way and finding teachers, contacting them. So John Magnuson in the Valley is um, uh, a teacher that I studied with a lot. And he was like my main teacher for a while. He was the faculty member at Cal State Northridge. And I also took lessons with um, Emil Richards, who was a big studio player in uh, Los Angeles. RIP just passed away. Um, and Judy Chilnick, also a local freelance player. Um, and actually with Judy Chilnick, she actually introduced me to Eric Forster, who is the percussion director at USC uh, when I first got there. So without her, I wouldn't even, I would never even gone to USC. So um, she was she's been so crucial in my in my career, and she's still a, a big part uh, of my life. And you know, I owe a lot a lot to her. I went I went there, and a year later there was a faculty change, and that's when Jim and Joe came on board. So uh, and from there they just were like, not only are you focused on percussion, but now you're focused on orchestral percussion. Describe the difference between percussion and orchestral percussion i can tell you anything it can be a percussion instrument but i mean there are different categories like taiko drumming for uh, japan i mean there's congas there's you know panderos bombos there's a, a million african instruments i mean that is a whole nother thing in and of itself tam tams of course are from asia um but i mean you ha you have so many different families of just and genres, you know, so cajones and um, I mean, I could just keep going. I mean, <laughs> cowbells. I mean, just think about it. Just, there's so many different things. Vib but that's just the actual percussion instruments. There's like pitched. So like behind me, there's xylophone and marimba, which are not the same things, by the way. <laughs> but but I mean, just vibraphones. There's so many wacky things. There's timpani. Um, everything, everything you could possibly think of. But I mean, I've also, during some pieces, have had to play like an electric pad with a rooster sound. I've had to like <laughs> break plates in a, in a trash can. I have to go on top of this huge six foot box with this giant hammer that I probably sent in my in my picture with my bio, but it's this huge acne size hammer. And during this piece um, in a Mahler Symphony Number no. 6, I have to get up and smash this thing like Gallagher as hard as I can, <laughs> like three three times. So, I mean, I get to do a whole bunch of things. And also this thing back here, this jingling Johnny, um, <laughs> it's Turkish Crescent. I mean, okay. just so many wacky things. So. What did you call it? Jingling Johnny? A jingling Johnny. Yeah, I know. It's a Turkish Crescent and you're supposed to march with it and bang it on the ground. This sounds like a lot of fun. It is very fun. Drum <laughs> set? I mean, that's... That's amazing in and of itself, you know? Yeah, for sure. So how would you describe your relationship with music now? I would say it's very up there with essential <laughs> right now. Not only playing, um, especially during this time, but um, listening to a whole bunch of music. I love 
listening to all genres of music and I feel like if I don't listen to music a lot, I start feeling down and like I need music in my life. The purpose of this podcast is like this intersection. I call myself the health and happiness matchmaker, this intersection of health, happiness um, and storytelling. I love your story that, you know, this wasn't necessarily something like you knew from day one. Like, I listen to music every single day. I don't think there is a day that goes by that it's not part of my day. And that it's absolutely essential and necessary and required for my happiness. Would you say the same thing? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, it's like everyone has music for certain moods, you know? Exactly. <laughs> I was going there You need to have something next. like that. You need to have something like that. How have you personally been dealing with the change of 2020 um what does that look like for you in your life i have tried my best to try to make this a positive as much as i can as much as it's not <laughs> but you know all this downtime i normally don't have so i'd, mu I'd much rather take advantage of this and focus on things that aren't work related uh, but just honing my craft more um, focusing on other aspects of my life more um, things that I've neglected, really making sure things like health-wise are okay. And I think if I find if things, if I don't have that routine, um, I can quickly mentally and physically uh, go down. So, um, so I mean, especially with um, percussion, I'm like focusing on like, you know, more jazz vibes, going back to drum set, um, you know, other other genres of music that I haven't played before. Um, I've also been spending more time on social media and um, trying hey, hey, trying hey. to yeah <laughs> hey <laughs> and trying to expand that a little bit more and connect with people and you know it's amazing because I see a lot of powerhouse people out there on social media and just general uh, musicians on social media and it's amazing um, how much they can connect with their audience and how much change you can make with just that. Um, especially with, um, if, you know, if you're somewhat of an upper tier musician with a lot of status and, you know, technical and musical ability, um, it would, it's very hard for people, especially without means, to just even get a glimpse of um, that type of knowledge or tutelage. And um, if a lot of these people don't have hundreds of dollars to spend on lessons and, you know, it's, it's just really nice to see um, just some of the like some of this information getting out to the general public where everyone can grow. And it's a sign of the times, anyways. Not just in music. I mean, I think a college degree is going to be a lot less valuable, or is. I mean, so much of. I mean, what I do in my day to day now, like I've learned online, <laughs> or I yep. learned from mentors or others in my life. Like I didn't learn about business per se, in college. Now, having a broadcast background and all of that training, yes, but so much of this, like my kids will be able to get online and I don't know if they're going to be going to college, you know? So I think it's just a sign of this digital age that we're, we're living in. Do you think all of this that's kind of happened in this year is making music more accessible to more people? I would say so. I mean, especially for even just schools, um, I feel a lot more people have started their own platforms with online teaching and got honed that a little bit more. In like schools, um, normally have to wait for I guess artists to come in that are in town or fly them in to get them to teach. Um, whereas now, it's literally everyone's accessible and they can just record it and everyone can have that um, information. We everyone does need some type of in person something like. I, I what my hope is that this that that people don't fully go to online teaching because there is an aspect to teaching in person, especially with something physical like drums, um, and I mean just music in general. What you need to hear what what uh, what's happening. Um, so, but right now is definitely I mean there are pros and cons. So right, usually you're performing in front of many many people. Um, that I assume where you are as well, like performing arts centers around the country has had to stop. When is the last time that you've played in front of a, a full concert hall? 
Um, the, well, the last show I played um, was in the beginning of March. Um, funny enough, I don't, I can't, I can't remember um, the show I was playing because I mean that whole. Um, it's just kind of it just boggles no it just boggles my mind because I mean we were going full bore, um, just so much repertoire, so much music you know that was in my brain, um, and then for it to just abruptly stop, uh, and go from like you're just f cruising at 120 miles an hour and then all of a sudden you're at a dead stop, it just kind of uh, threw me. But I mean. I think we were in the midst of playing a whole bunch of youth shows, <laughs> so it was for a whole bunch of kids. Oh, wow. Um, but, um, yeah, I definitely miss it. So what is this like for you? Obviously, like, as a performer, I'm sure you feed off of that that energy, that live energy. We, we all, of course, are finding ways to connect virtually, but... How are you dealing with kind of missing that live, in-person concert experience? Oh, I definitely miss it. Everyone feeds off of their audience. And, you know, that's, that's why, you know, baseball players and football players that have audience noise being pumped in aren't fans <laughs> because it feels, it feels artificial. They need to see people just like going crazy. Just pure audience sound alone, it could be deafening. So, I mean, it is, it can be absolutely exhilarating to just be on stage with someone that powerful and just see everyone um, just feed off of this. And it's so amazing. And it's one of the best parts of my job, you know, is to feel that satisfaction of this, you know, this is why I do this is for everyone to enjoy it. What's been a highlight of your professional music career? Um, well, there have, been a, there have been a few, actually. I got to play on the uh, West Side Story soundtrack, my first ever like movie recording session with the LA Philharmonic and Dudamel. So other things is I did a show I was just talking about with Katy Perry. That was a free benefit concert. It was with Katy Perry, Chris Martin. It was, you know, fireworks and all that stuff. And that was absolutely <laughs> amazing and thrilling. Got to play with Nile Rodgers and Chic. My first gig with LA Phil is I got to be... Um, on the field at Dodger Stadium, playing the Star Spangled Banner for Vin Scully's last home game, who was our our um, our announcer, um, iconic announcer. And so John Williams, yeah. w we did the music of John Williams. He was conducting, um, and then we were on. So from my vantage point, it went Dodgers, all of the Dodger bullpen on one side, all of the Rockies on one side. You have Vin Scully, the manager, Sandy Koufax, all these amazing baseball players, their families, and an. I mean, uh, there, was, there wasn't a, an empty seat in Dodger Stadium. And Dodger oh Stadium holds the most people in, out of all major uh, baseball stadiums. So, I mean, it was so loud and amazing. Before music, I was thinking about trying to become a professional baseball player. So I... Mm. So it's like worlds literally colliding in that moment. Yeah. You're like, what is my life? Yeah. In the, in the best way, though. Exactly. <laughs> What do you see happening over the next 12 months in your world, in the world of music? I definitely think that, um, especially as a vaccine comes out, um, there was, there's going to be a lot of easing off of these restrictions when it comes to people attending even small events, super spread out. I mean, there's already, they're already doing that without a vaccine. So at this point, I think a lot of people are just starved for some type of live something. And, you know, especially, you know, just even if it's going to like a sporting event, going to, you know, seeing a movie, doing something outside that's social is just everyone craves um, without right. just fearing for their life. It's going to take a little bit for arts to recover from this. And I think any gig related um, occupations, it's going to take a, a while for all of these occupations to recover because, um, I mean, this is uh, quite the hit for freelancers. Uh, there, everyone is cutting back. Even people that did have job security are getting furloughed. You know, it's just a really rough world right now for um Musicians and even as I was talking about with like gig musicians, uh, they are all starving, and that's why you see a lot of these people turning to online platforms with teaching and um, you know their own businesses, blogs, you know anything you can do to just you know stay relevant. Yeah, in those moments where you feel starved for music, or you feel that you're missing it, or 
the low moments, what do you do to pull yourself out of that? Uh, I just start, I mean, practicing um, other other things that I like to do, or I go out and I just golf. <laughs> yeah. Because that's a, actually somewhat of a safe activity right now. Yeah. Um, and then uh, every now and then, you know, I'll I'll do a whole bunch of cooking. I definitely been getting way more into cooking as everyone is. I'm. Um, but yeah, I totally agree. I mean, there's definitely like a, a healing power to music, of course, in this you know, ability to change and uplift your mood um, with music. So I'm sure that's been key for you throughout this whole quarantine. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when it comes to me personally finding some success with, uh, you know, auditions, what we is how we get our job, you know, audition, uh, national and worldwide auditions. And um, but besides that, you know, I have to make sure I'm feeling good physically to do my job properly. And I can't stress that enough, especially when I was auditioning. If I wasn't going to the gym or, you know, eating somewhat right and, you know, feeling just good as a person, um, I, I found it very hard to have any type of success. Really, really needed. Yeah. Um, it impacted your of, craft. Absolutely. You know, during all of this, it's been high, hard to kind of strike up that balance as far as like self care, getting in a routine. You mentioned routine earlier, which is, I think, so important when you kind of have this monotony now to your day. Um, so, in the beginning, it, it it was hard. It was challenging to be like, okay, you know, I live at home, I work at home, I work out at home, I socialize at home, have happy hour at home, I eat at home, like home yep. is everything. Home so is there's, everything now, yeah. <laughs> there's a monotony to that, which makes it kind of challenging, at least for me, to find and carve out a schedule at times. I think I'm kind of in that now, but when I didn't have it for a period, yeah, I just felt like I couldn't be productive at what I do. And I was hearing a little bit of um, a sports psychologist, uh, Dr. Don Green, who's, who teaches out at Colburn School out in Los Angeles. It's a music school. But he also trains like a whole bunch of athletes and all these, all these people. Um, was saying, was, he was just talking about what's going to happen with everyone and their mental health. Mm -hmm. And it's basically as if we, everyone went through a traumatic experience and you're going to go through a period of denial and you need to go through acceptance and, you know, the whole, the, all the stages. And... Um, it's, there's going to be quite the adjustment, especially when things start getting back to normal. I feel like um, mentally it's going to be really hard for people to accept that we can do this and be completely safe, especially for a bit, even while a vaccine's out there, because you're like, I don't even know who's having a vaccine, who had a vaccine or if right. that even works properly. Do you have, I always ask for health tips, but this can be a health or happiness tip from you that has, you know kept you going or anything that you would suggest to the viewers that they could implement right now in their life? It's really easy to just start getting really down. And I think everyone has to um, every now and then just take a step back and just decompress and um, learn to be a, a kid again when it comes to just how you recoup. Don't worry about the things right now, the, especially the things that are out of your control and um, try to um, prioritize the things that are that you cherish in life and learn to enjoy the time with all these people or friends or family and you know and just try to better yourself when uh, every if a little amount counts you know a little a little amount goes a long way and um discover Focus new music good. that you like uh, there you go discover new music that you like where do you go to discover new music um, I just go, there's, there's a whole bunch of reviews online you can find for different genres like jazz or orchestral or, um, you know, rap, you know, whatever, you know, I just kind of go down the road of, you know, everything because I've always kind of asked myself, uh, whenever there's music I don't like, I always ask myself, like, why don't I like this music? And inevitably it's like, I don't know, that's like a, not a really good answer. So you should, <laughs> you should just try to see what the fuss is about the music and see if you like it. But um, uh, yeah, just trying to be very open and just seeing what you like and see what makes you move and seeing, uh, 
you know, every now and then it's okay to have like a little dance party in your living room. Mm. <laughs> I love that. Every no- and and that is right. And it happens more often than not here at my household. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Glass of wine, some music. <laughs> you start dancing. It's fine. There you go. So what's next for you? Do you have anything in the works? that you can share, anything different going on, anything coming up that's new or different or interesting? Well, our orchestra has officially canceled our season through up till around um, June. So our official uh, season is canceled. Um, so in that time, they're gonna be bringing us back in to you know, record a few shows at the Bowl. Um, and the, the LA Phil's kind of upping their social media game and content and stuff, so. Um, even though our official season is canceled, we're going to have somewhat of an unofficial season with other things being recorded. So definitely a lot of that. Um, I've been giving a whole bunch of master classes um, around the world. I did one in London, did one in Australia. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm doing one for UCLA, one for USC. So, I mean, ton of this, ton of those, ton of... Um, I'm teaching with YOLA, or youth orchestra, uh, out here just to make... I love giving back to the kids. Um, and yeah, just uh, I just keep golfing, I guess. I mean, <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. But I know you are also, yeah. you know, creating some online content on your own channel. So tell everyone where they can connect with you, find more about you. And so that I can link all that below. Yeah, Matt Howard Perk on Instagram. Uh, I'm on Facebook, but I'm, I have a YouTube channel as well. Um, but mainly I've just been working off of, uh, Instagram and, uh, doing, a, doing some lives, um, doing some collaborations, talking with, uh, a couple people and, um, kind of every now and then I'll, um, record some solos on snare drum or put, you know, different things that I'm working on or even pieces that I've recorded. So, um, if you guys want to check, th- check that out, I've, I'm probably going to come up with some more content, um, shortly. So, um, hope you all can, can see. Yeah, that would be awesome. And I'll make sure to link to that below so they can easily oh, find thank you, you and check you out. Is there anything else, Matt, that I didn't ask you that you wanted to add? No, this has been absolutely amazing. <laughs> and it's, it's nice seeing you. It's been it's been forever. So. I know. It's nice seeing you, too. This is fun. This is like the Yeah, thank you so much for having up. me on this. This is so amazing. <laughs> thank you. I hope you enjoyed that discussion with Matt as much as I did. It was like catching up with an old friend for me, but also really fun to just learn things about him that I didn't know before. And honestly, um, he has a story that's not traditional, but then again, who does? So please connect with him, find his information down below and connect with me. Find me on LinkedIn, Tamika Bickham, or TV Media Group, and also hit subscribe on YouTube. I'd love to hear what you think about the show, so leave me an honest review on Apple Podcasts. I would greatly appreciate it. It helps me improve the show for you each and every week. And I know I'm going to see you back next week. So until then, stay happy, stay healthy.